A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wahduhu la sharika lahu wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. Assalamu alaykum. Okay, I know you haven't fueled up, you haven't eaten yet, but still give me a little bit more. Assalamu alaykum. Alhamdulillah, much better, much better. Brothers and sisters, I'm really honored and privileged not only to be here tonight with you at this dinner, a very important occasion, but I'm even more excited about living in a pivotal time in the history of this nation and in the history of the world. This is not hyperbole. I'm not saying this trying to exaggerate our current condition in this country. But when you reflect upon this nation only being 243 years old, let me say that again, 243 years old. My house is almost 243 years old. And when you look at the history of nations, this is not a long time. And so when we talk about the evolution and the development of the Muslim community and our institutions in this country, we're talking about we are still involved at a very early stage in the history of this country and we are involved at a time. Whether or not we want to accept this reality or not, we are involved in this nation at a time when it's at a very critical moment in history. Because you and I and the Muslims of this nation have to decide what side of history do we want to be on? What side of history, when the history of this nation is recorded, when all of us are presented with our book on Yamaki Yama, we're going to be asked, Maybe not in that specific term, but we're going to be asked, what side of history were you on living in the 21st century here in the United States? And so as we talk about a council for social justice and a reason for having it, we're not talking about this is the first time that Muslims have been involved in social justice issues in this country. We're talking about this specific organization of ICNA and its specific entry and involvement in those things involving not just the Muslim community, but those issues that are impacting all citizens and residents of this country. Those things that we know about and have spoken about so often. I used to live up here in D.C., not out in the DMV. When I first heard this area referred to as DMV, I thought you were talking about Department of Motor Vehicles. <laughs> DMV? What is, what is a DMV? But I used to live actually in Washington, D.C. for 10 years. And when I was in Washington, D.C., as it's been spoken about earlier, Muslims had a presence in this particular community. The presence was nothing like we have today, but there was a presence. And there was a small recognition of the role that Muslims were playing in the prisons in this area, in this DMV area. There was a recognition of the role that the Muslims we're doing in this area of social justice and in that area. So we are at the forefront. We are really at the beginning of an early years and age of this nation. So don't think about our being so far behind because we're not. I want to just share just a few points with you and I'll sit down. See, I know where the timekeeper is. And I've been speaking long enough to know that when you know where the timekeeper is, you never look at him. Because he's going to hold up a card. He's going to slip up behind me, and I'll just start and turn this way and talk to the audience on this side. But I have a few points that I'd like to share with you before I sit down. 
And I want to share a point. When Keith Ellison did a ceremonial swearing in on the Quran of Thomas Jefferson, when he did this, many of citizens in this country were shocked. What was Thomas Jefferson doing with the Quran? Why would he have this book? But I want to, to use this Quran of Thomas Jefferson. I want to use the attitude of the founding fathers of this country and just speak a little bit, just for a moment, to set a stage for us to understand what kind of environment as have we as Muslims always experienced in this land. Thomas Jefferson had a Quran. Of course he did. Many believe that he probably had at least two because the first one that he had got burnt up, is believed burnt up in a fire. So whether that one was burned up or not, and Keith Ellison and others now have ceremonial, uh, uh, in a ceremonious way sworn in to the House of Representatives on that Quran or not. We need to know that at that time of the founding of this nation, there was a debate about what would be the civil rights, who would be allowed to be citizens in this country. And Thomas Jefferson was on the side of even the Muslims, even the Mohammedans, even the Turks would be allowed, should be allowed to be citizens in this country. And when Thomas Jefferson wrote and spoke about how Muslims should be allowed not only full citizenship, but should be allowed to have freedom of religion, that what Thomas Jefferson didn't know was that he had never, to his knowledge, ever met a Muslim woman when he was saying these words. But as my brother Amir pointed out, there were Muslims on Thomas Jefferson's plantation. There were African enslaved people who had been kidnapped and brought to this country. So why, all, while all of the good sounding words about freedom and equality for everyone, that even Muslims, if we have Muslims in this country, they should be allowed to practice their religion. They should be allowed to run for office. The reality was that there were Muslims already here by the thousands. But those Muslims were being denied every dimension and aspect, not just of being an American citizen, but being a human being under this hideous chattel slavery. And so the Muslim community in the United States started out in a struggle for social justice. And so people like Balahi Muhammad, alhamdulillah, he was in an area on a plantation where Thomas Spaulding allowed his Muslims to gather together to pray Salat al-Jumma for them to have go through the Muslim rituals of Salah, of Nikah, and all of these things in that history. Like Brother Amir has te is telling us these stories that was a part of the struggle of Muslims to maintain their Islam. They were not converts to this religion like I was a convert a few years ago. And so when we move away from this period of these founding fathers and this imaginary talk or the talk about imaginary Muslims in the country, we have to recognize, no, Tommy boy, there were already Muslims in this nation. And Tommy, you had them right on your own plantation, you and your boy, George. George had more on his plantation than you got on your plantation. So Muslims have been here. 
We have been here in struggle as I move quickly. See that? I told you, I shouldn't even look down. Shouldn't even look down, man. I know better than that. But uh, to bring it to a conclusion, that you and I, as it's already been said, when we struggle for the rights, the civil rights, the human rights, for everyone in this land, everyone in this country, not just for some human beings, but for all human beings. That when you and I don't be a part of this ongoing struggle, it tells a lie against Islam itself. Because the people that are in sharing this space with us, they will look at us and think, in spite of everything that's happening in this nation, Islam must not have anything to say or anything, any input in this particular situation. And so it gives lie to the religion itself through our silence, through our inaction, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded us to not just stand up for justice, be standard bearers, be in the forefront for justice. And so we don't have an excuse. And if we do, remain silent, particularly when you think about the times that we're living in today. I'm going to share this and I'll be quiet. For so many years, so many years, particularly after I became Muslim as a senior at Howard University, that there were young brothers and sisters, much younger than me, who I think they thought I was a little older than I actually am. And they would say, what was it like back during that time? I was about to think that somebody was going to ask me, when Frederick Douglass was alive, what was it like when Frederick Douglass was alive? But I told them, even then, be patient. Because the conditions that you are referencing, the struggles that were demanded of the people of that time, you're going to have an opportunity to have a similar kind of struggle. That you are going to have to benefit from that work of those who've come before you and then add something to the picture. You will have the opportunity. You don't have to have been alive during the civil rights struggle in this country, to know about it and to recognize how this was a mass movement. It wasn't just about individuals. This was a mass movement that took, caught fire all across the nation. You will have an opportunity, here he goes. You will have the opportunity to be able to be a part of a collective action to bring true justice and equality to this land. Now, I'll generally say three times that I'm closing. I'll just say twice now because he's already at the foot of the steps. In closing, I want to emphasize how the struggle, the efforts of social justice for Muslims in this country is something that all of us should be involved in in one way or another. We would love for you to be involved in our Muslim prisoner support project and go to the jails and provide services and lectures and all of that. But if the jail ain't your thing, because I know some brothers in North Carolina that I've taken them with me to visit certain prisons, and the first time they hear those metal doors slam behind them, they almost wet their pants. It's like, what in the world? You mean you're going to go sit up in there with all this metal between you and the outside, and you being there with these people? That may not be your thing. But you can contribute financially to help us buy prayer rugs and get Qurans and provide for other needs. Whether your thing 
is getting out there on the front line, advocating for the rights of those whose rights are being denied or not, there is something that you can do. And if that something is no more than making dua, never underestimate the power of dua. It's the greatest weapon that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us if we want change then turn to the one who has said about himself, I have made doom, I have made oppression unlawful for myself. So don't you oppress, don't you be a part of the oppressors and let us not be part of that by remaining silent. As-salamu alaykum.